So, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Robin Davies. I'm the head of the Centre for Health Security in the Department of Foreign Affairs and, and Trade. Um, my role is simply to MC and otherwise be unobtrusive. Um, thank you all for coming. It's a great turnout. Um, I'm going to hand over immediately to Claire Walsh, who's the Deputy, Deputy Secretary with responsibility for international development assistance um, in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Thank you, Robin, and good evening, everybody. I'm actually here representing Frances Adamson, who is the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, and she is very disappointed not to have been here. One, she really did want to uh, be able to open this, um, this session tonight, but also she was absolutely genuinely interested in the lecture that was going to be given, and so she's also very disappointed to uh, miss the uh, actual substance of the discussion. So please accept her apologies. Uh, before I start, can I also acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional custodians on, of the land on which we, we meet this evening, the Ngunnawal people, and uh, pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, can I also acknowledge some very important people we have with us today. His Excellency, Kwang Goi, who is the Ambassador of the Royal Embassy of Cambodia. Nice to have you here. Uh, could I also uh, welcome and acknowledge Mr. Jatulong Buasi Sawat, uh, the Deputy Head of Mission, Embassy of Lao People's Democratic Republic. Mr. David Langford the brother of our honoree, um, Professor Ruth Bishop, and his wife, Margaret, and daughter, Sue, uh, who actually works for DFAT. So there's a very nice uh, synergy in all of that. Uh, could I recognise Professor Brendan Murphy, Australia's Chief Medical Officer, and other distinguished members of the Diplomatic Corps, uh, and leadership from Australians, Australian National University here tonight. Uh, in 2017, the Australian Government acknowledged that health security, protecting our region against infectious disease threats, required a greater collaborative effort from all of us, and that Australia is well placed to play a leadership role in this field. It is a theme that was then subsequently echoed in our foreign policy white paper, which outlines that guarding against global health risks as one of our priorities for global cooperation. I'm talking to the converted, I'm sure, but we all recognise the importance of good health and strong, resilient health systems to support productive societies and economic growth. Uh, just as we recognise health as an enabler for growth, um, so too can health crises threaten all that we have worked so hard to achieve. A major disease outbreak would have severe health and economic implications for the Indo-Pacific region and for Australia, costing lives, disrupting trade, investment and the movement of people. And this is why the government has allocated uh, $300 million over five years to combat these threats and why we've established the Indo-Pacific Centre for Health Security in DFAT, which uh, Robin needs. The centre represents a new model for development cooperation uh, bringing together expertise from mul multiple policy and scientific agencies across government. Today, I'm especially pleased to welcome the first cohort of the ASEAN, the four ASEAN Australia Health Security Fellows. As many of you will know, they are being supported to undertake a master's degree in field epidemiology at the university, the Australian National University. It's a world-class qualification and the only one of its kind in Australia. In addition to supporting scholars from ASEAN countries, the program is also supporting capacity building placements in Southeast Asia for selected Australian field epidemiology scholars. I'm very pleased uh, that I was able to meet with our four scholars a few moments ago. And please forgive me if I get some of the pronunciations wrong. <laughs> Dr. Vanida Duang Bupa from Laos, uh, Mr. Shreen uh, Chin from Cambodia, Ms. Emily Holt, that one I can pronounce, who will be placed at the National Centre for Laboratory and Epidemiology in Laos, and Ms. Eleanor Kerr, who will be placed at the Pasteur Institute in Cambodia. 
I'm confident that this new program will do much to develop the people to people links and better prepare the health workforce in our region to prevent and respond to infectious disease threats. I'm also very pleased uh, in the week following International Women's Day to launch this new health security address named in honour of Professor Ruth Bishop, a pioneering Australian virologist, and to introduce one of Australia's leading medical researchers, Professor Sharon Moon of the Doherty Institute for, Infectious, for Infection and Immunity. While Professor Bishop was unable to be here with us this evening, she is represented by several members of her family, and we're very pleased to have you here. I think I, 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 I um, refer to you in the um, earlier remarks. Professor Bishop led the team of researchers that discovered rotavirus, ultimately leading to the development of an effective vaccine to protect children against it. For her contribution to health security and the improvement of children's health, Professor Bishop was made an Officer of the Order of Australia in 1996 and in 2013 became the first woman to be awarded the Flory Medal, sorry, the Flory Medal by the Australian Association of Medical Research, Research Institutes. I would like to acknowledge Professor Bishop's achievements and express my appreciation to her and her family for allowing us to name this lecture in her honour. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Professor Sharon Lewin. Sharon was appointed inaugural director of the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity, a joint venture between the University of Melbourne and the Royal Melbourne Hospital in 2014. Sharon's vision and that of the Doherty Institute is to improve health globally through discovery research and the prevention, treatment and cure of infectious diseases. Sharon has been particularly lauded for her role in HIV and AIDS research and has attracted way too many honours for me to list this evening. Most recently on Australia Day, in the, just a, a few weeks ago really, she was appointed an Officer of the Order of Australia, just as Ruth Bishop was 23 years ago. Uh, congratulations for that, that's a, a fantastic recognition of the work that you do. The title of her address this evening is From HIV to Zika, Building on Lessons Learnt to be Fully prepared, prepared for What Might Be Next. Thank you, Sharon, and please come to the podium. Uh, thank you very much for that very kind introduction, and I too would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and welcome um, any Indigenous people here today. Um, what a great honour this is to give this lecture, the first lecture, and I wanted to thank Robin Davies particularly and DFAT for organising it. And um, as I look out in the room, I can see um, many distinguished guests, of course, uh, and friends and colleagues, and I hope interested members of the public that care about health security and care about what Australia can do, particularly in this region, with respect to health security, because I think um, we can do a lot. And so what I want to talk to you today is take you on a bit of a journey of the sorts of emerging uh, diseases that we've dealt with in the last three decades, using a few key examples, and um, some of the ways that's informing how we're thinking about our response uh, going forward. But before I start, um, I do want to talk a little bit um, about Ruth Bishop. And we heard earlier um, from the Deputy Secretary that um, Ruth Bishop's famous for having discovered a new virus. Um, the new virus was rotavirus. It's called rotavirus because it's shaped a bit like a wheel that you can see up in the image there from 1973. And, um, it's every virologist's dream to discover a new virus. Not many of us get that opportunity, um, and not many of us get that opportunity to discover something like a new virus, characterise what that means and how you develop immunity to it, um, develop a vaccine and then see it implemented in, in just um, one career, which is quite extraordinary. And I see that Ruth Bishop did all of that, so something that many of us um, aspire to. So 
Um, Ruth Bishop's great observation was uh, working out that babies actually developed immunity to this virus, and therefore if they developed immunity, you could potentially generate that through a vaccine. And um, the, the development of a vaccine for rotavirus um, has literally saved millions and millions of lives. And I heard a very interesting story um, from Helen Evans, who's here this evening, who told me that Bill and Melinda Gates were most captivated about um, doing something for global health after they visited Africa and saw that so many babies die of diarrhoea and there's a from rotavirus related diarrhoea and that a vaccine was available but the vaccine was so expensive it wasn't able to be delivered in the countries where children are dying of the vaccine and that led to a significant investment uh, from the Gates Foundation and a whole range of vaccines and issues of global health. The vaccine is now available in more than 50 um, low income countries and saved many, many lives. And um, the journey that uh, Ruth took from that discovery in 1973 of rotavirus, particularly actually this strain RV3BB, was just um, tested uh, in a placebo controlled trial and published in the New Journal of Medicine last year, one of the most um, highly credible medical journals um, showing its efficacy. A, a, a significant advance on what vaccines we currently have for rotavirus because this is given actually at birth which means that the uptake will be much more significant. And I was delighted to see that actually Ruth is a co-author on this paper. So from 1973 to 2018 I'm um, publishing um, the best work. Um, to me on a, on a very personal level um, her story is remarkable. And most importantly, she um, is a woman and a mother and achieved such extraordinary success um, while raising a family in the, in the 1970s. Pretty, pretty rare. Um, women still battle um, in science, being successful in science in 2018, um, and she managed to do that in the 1970s. Second, as a virologist, as I explained before, um, the ultimate dream of every virologist is discovering a new virus, but the careful observations um, that she made in order to take the, um, her discovery to the next step. And that is probably the most um, inspiring thing to me, was that she didn't, didn't stop there with the discovery of an interesting um, scientific finding. Um, she actually took the next step of transforming that discovery um, to developing a solution that saved lives. And I think that is really what drives many of us in science, um, in clinical medicine, in clinical research, in global health. And so she managed to transverse that um, entire um, scientific spectrum from discovery to translation to implementation. Areas that I think Australia can play a very major role in. She's actually recognised um, globally as one of the world's uh, vaccine heroes. Um, this is a beautiful slide uh, given to me by Julie Byers, who now leads the rotavirus program at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute who worked with Julia Bishop. And the photograph was taken by Annie Leibowitz, some of you may know. Annie Leibowitz, a fabulous, um, fabulous photographer, was commissioned by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And actually in the photograph, I won't go through who each of the people are, but um, in front of you are the inventors, all their relatives of probably every significant vaccine, vaccines for polio, rubella, um, meningitis, and pneumococcus. And of course, um, you can see Ruth Bishop um, up here. It's a shame it's in black and white because I understand she was wearing a bright red jacket that she used to like to wear. So it would have looked great just black and white with the red jacket. So she's um, clearly prominent here as the discoverer of rotavirus vaccine. Um, but this one up down here on the left is Dr. Xiao Yi Su. And Dr. Xiao's uh, late husband, Dr. Jian Zhu, was the co founder of the human papillomavirus vaccine. Uh, which he co-discovered with Ian Fraser and other Australian. So I think that's pretty incredible. We're looking at the photograph of our century's vaccine heroes and we have two Australians uh, represented. So vaccines are an important way that we can deal with infectious diseases. We have lots of effective vaccines. They're listed in front of you. 
and many, many of these vaccines work really, really well. But actually, out of all of this list of vaccines for infectious diseases, eradication or elimination of an infectious disease is extremely rare, and we've only um, eliminated one, which is smallpox. And on this list of vaccines, uh, we still have many gaps. We don't have a vaccine, an effective vaccine for malaria. We don't have an effective vaccine for HIV. And every time we see a new infectious disease emerge, there's a scramble to develop vaccines for whether it's MERS or MEPA or other viruses. And even when we have this um, material of vaccines that work, we still see people, um, particularly young children, are dying of vaccine-related diseases. So there's a lot of work to do, not just in developing new vaccines, but implementing vaccines that we know um, already work. And if you look at the top five causes of death globally, um, you can see in 2007 that three of the five um, top causes of death globally were um, related to infectious diseases, lower respiratory tract infections, diarrheal diseases and HIV. And there has been some progress when you look at the top causes of death in 2017, um, with HIV AIDS slipping down that list to number 15, and I'll talk a little bit about why. But diarrheal disease and lower respiratory infects, infections still rank there in the top five causes of death, which is um, quite extraordinary and gives you an indication about why um, uh, uh, work in this area remains so important. 15% of deaths worldwide are from infectious diseases. And although many of us are worried about the increasing burden of non-communicable diseases globally, infectious diseases, in addition to um, effects on mortality, have a very significant effect on morbidity and can also paralyse our health systems in the setting of different outbreaks. So why is all this important for health security? Well, infectious diseases, um, established infectious diseases that have been around for many, many years, um, emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases all have the potential to cause significant um, economic harms on a regional or global scale. And I'm going to just give you three examples here um, that come from the Global Fund. Um, Ebola, the outbreak in Ebola in 2014 to 2015 killed about 11,000 people and caused about a $3 billion loss um, in the economic um, uh, uh, gains in West Africa. Tuberculosis, what I'd classify as an established infectious disease for which we have curative treatment, six months of drugs, potentially even less um, now, um, and yet we still battle the global burden of tuberculosis. With the estimated cost of $1 trillion in the next um, 15 years if we're unable to tackle this, equivalent to the GDP of the Netherlands. And finally, malaria, also what I'll term an established um, infectious disease. WHO estimates that $4 trillion in economic gains will be generated by eliminating malaria by 2030. And although there have been some very good success stories from um, malaria with declining numbers of deaths from malaria, um, this, uh, and many people think that this could be an achievable target. Many people are sitting in the room working hard towards the elimination of malaria. But I think um, the other important issue is that this is not just about economics. Um, I'm sure everyone in this room also believes that health security is really very much um, a human right, that often um, health security challenges communities that are most powerless um, and invisible. And it's inextricably, health security is inextricably linked to strong, building stronger local communities. Um, and if we do that in our world and in our region, in turn, that's good for everyone, including um, Australians. But probably what people worry about most with, um, with, uh, with emerging infectious diseases is that, um, and I know I'm probably stating the obvious for this room, is that you know, microbes do not know national borders, an infectious disease threat anywhere is a threat everywhere, and that making our world safer from ep epidemics means strengthening the capacity of countries to prevent, detect and respond effectively to current and emerging health threats. And we have some very um, significant challenges. 
So this um, map of the world uh, shows you the major emerging disease which was of higher significance in the 1980s and still remains a disease of high significance. But that was the major challenge in the 1980s. And this work actually comes from um, Anthony Fauci, who's spoken and published a lot, the head of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And he created this map of what uh, we're dealing with now. And you can see here the emerging, re-emerging, and deliberately emerging, that just covers anthrax, infections that we um, need to be worried about in 2019. So you can see there is um, an enormous challenge. And first, it's key to think, why are we seeing these um, emergence of so many new um, infectious diseases, and particularly over the last three decades? And there are lots of different explanations for why we're seeing this change. Many of the diseases on that list uh, come from uh, zoonoses, so they come from animals. Some of them are particularly from um, the cat species. Many of them are carried and transmitted by um, uh, vectors such as bats or mosquitoes. But breakdown in public health programs and in the setting of economic or civil unrest, increased urbanisation, and certainly climate change is playing a major role in driving um, emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. And in fact, the WHO estimate that by 2030, uh, rising temperatures will lead to 60,000 more deaths from malaria and 48,000 additional deaths due to diarrhoea each year. So these are very, very major significant problems that are driving changes in our ecosystem. And of course, the issue of travel. Um, this uh, diagram uh, just shows you movement across the world over a 24-hour period. Um, I'm just going to show you a fraction of the video. Um, it just shows you plane travel um, across the world and why an infectious disease can occur in one part of the world and rapidly move within a 24-hour period. So before I start, talk to you a bit about some of these emerging um, diseases, I want to go um, to a core um, uh, argument that I'd like to make um, in this lecture that strengthening, we do need to worry about emerging and re-emerging diseases, but strengthening global health security really has to start from protecting people from diseases they face today. And those big three are HIV, TB and malaria. Um, they account for um, three million deaths alone back in 2016. I'm going to talk a little bit more about HIV. It's where I've spent um, pretty much my entire career working. Um, I started medicine in the early 80s when HIV had not yet been discovered. I spent my early clinical years at the time of the Green Reaper, uh, which many people in the audience will know, but I find the more I give this talk, an increasing number of certainly medical students don't know what the Green Reaper was, but it was an alarming campaign of what the, or the really um, alarming campaign to tell people about HIV, but it very much captured what people felt about HIV at that time, um, highly stigmatised and a death sentence. And then over the course of my um, career, um, as uh, in common with many people in the room, you know, we've seen this dramatic change um, in the outlook for HIV. And although controversial people talking about um, whether we might even see the end of AIDS, I want to talk a little bit about what led to that transformation and what this, why HIV was able to evolve or change or the outlook was so dramatic over the last 30 years and perhaps take some lessons into how we might approach new infectious diseases. And then I'll talk a little bit more about, um, uh, about emerging infectious diseases. So one of the first um, lessons from HIV for me is that investment in science has paid off. So um, this is an image of a man um, in what HIV used to look like in the absence of antiretroviral treatment, um, a universal death sentence, and then on the right is the same individual after taking antiretroviral therapy. But the development of antiretroviral therapy didn't happen um, on its own. It needed billions of dollars of investment in the science, understanding the virus, understanding how it, uh, how it replicates, 
working with the private sector to develop new medications, and then more recently, especially over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, working to make sure that those drugs are cheap and accessible globally. And that investment has indeed paid off. Um, numbers of AIDS-related deaths uh, continue to decline globally, although I should add there are still one million uh, people a year that die of HIV. And on the right is what HIV treatment looks like now, um, literally a single tablet a day, costed at around $50 to $100 a year in low and middle income countries, and about half the world's population living with HIV now can access treatment. That's the good news story. You could also, uh, you could also think, well, half have still not have access to antiretroviral treatment and anyone that does have access needs lifelong care. There have been incredible advances in HIV prevention. Um, on the left, many of them will be familiar to you, um, condoms and screening um, the blood supply. But on the right is probably the most dramatic advance we've had in HIV prevention in the entire history of HIV, and that's pre-exposure prophylaxis or taking an antiviral medication to prevent you becoming infected with HIV. So that's about 95 to 99% efficacy. It's almost as good, or probably just as good, as taking the pill to prevent pregnancy. And yet very, very few countries have been able to implement um, widespread access to PrEP. A whole lot of um, different reasons why that's the case, but funding certainly is one um, underlying uh, cause of that. Second major um, uh, uh, lesson from HIV is the effect eff efficacy and impact of working in partnership with civil society. It's been the story of HIV from the beginning, um, initially of course largely with gay men in high income countries, but now those partnerships are extended um, across the world in low income settings and have been a major driver for why access to treatment had the rapid access to treatment has been so effective. And this is a really um, uh, important issue, and it's a very challenging issue in the setting of an emerging infectious disease because there's no time to create those, those deep partnerships, which do, uh, don't just come, by, um, uh, come very quickly. They need a long um, period of building um, trust, and um, capacity building and understanding in understanding the science. We saw how difficult that was, for example, in Ebola, when um, uh, the, a key component of stopping the Ebola outbreak in West Africa was around practices related to burials. But that the, the relationship with the community took a long time to really establish to stop the key practice that was leading to transmission. But that has definitely been one of the real um, drivers of the great successes in HIV. And that partnership continues to be um, incredibly important, as does um, the advocacy from civil society. The third um, key lesson from HIV was, has been a significant mobilisation of funding globally. And this just gives you a timeline on, and an estimate of the sorts of money that's been invested in the HIV response. Starting back in um, the early days in 1986 with a, um, a tiny amount of money invested, um, increasing to in 2013 close to $19 billion um, a year being going towards supporting HIV. Number of um, key drivers for that, um, certainly the philanthropy, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the US government through their um, program called PEPFAR that I'll speak later about, UN agencies um, that drove both funding um, through the Global Fund and advocacy through UNAIDS. But what's um, of concern uh, with the HIV response is that treatment is lifelong. So once people are on treatment, um, there's no prospect of them stopping treatment unless we one day find a cure. So we're locked into a bind of requiring this level of investment and funding indefinitely at the moment. And what we're seeing is that global funding for HIV is actually decreasing. So from 2013 to 2016, about a 20% decline in HIV funding. And I think it's important to realise that um, much of the funding for HIV is heavily dependent 
on US contributions, and I think that has some inherent vulnerabilities. So that $7 billion, um, if you look at current funding, most of it from bilateral um, initiatives, but also significant amounts for the Global Fund and another organisation, Unitaid. And about 67% of it, about two thirds, comes from the United States. So that's very vulnerable, particularly um, in the current uh, economic climate. And I finally wanted to end with HIV, that it's not all rosy. Um, there are major challenges still um, in HIV management, and particularly in our region in the Asia Pacific. And it, um, it's an example of the fact that we may have the tools to um, end HIV or to stop transmission or to stop di people dying of AIDS, but it's the implementation that's absolutely key. So just in our region, we still are seeing high rates of HIV drug resistance in Papua New Guinea. We almost see no drug resistance in a country like Australia. It's driven by um, adherence to medication. Indonesia has um, one of the highest rates of mother-to-child transmission of HIV, um, while many, many countries, including low- and middle-income countries, are reporting the elimination of mother-to-child transmission of HIV. And in the Philippines, um, a rapid increase in new HIV diagnoses in men who are sex with men, um, largely due to criminalisation and, and uh, public health programs for men who are sex with men. So although the advances have been um, extraordinary in HIV, um, we have the tools that I think really could end the epidemic. We're still struggling and we will still have an ongoing struggle on implementation. I want to switch tack a bit now and talk about what happens when a sudden new disease appears and what that can do. And the best example of that um, is with SARS. So SARS um, appeared in 2003 um, from a uh, series of cases that were um, based in Hong Kong and within days managed to spread across the world um, through in, throughout Asia. Um, into Europe and into the US. And um, I remember this very, very clearly. I actually had just started my first job as head of infection, just started um, at my, my job at that time as head of infectious diseases at the Alfred Hospital. It was about a month later that SARS appeared. And although we never had any cases of SARS, and I'm sure many, of you, many people in the room will remember this, the, um, the uh, effort and time required just to be prepared for what might happen or whether, when that first case would be diagnosed or to make sure that staff were safe, to reduce hysteria about the concept of um, or the idea that SARS was going to come or could potentially be um, in one of our hospitals was very, very significant. And that was at a very local level, but I know at a global level, um, similar experiences were shared. So SARS appeared and disappeared um, over nine months. Um, there was about 8,000 cases, about 774 deaths. And um, I did get this slide from Tony Fauci. He has got red, um, ha has got the Australia highlight in red here, but there were no um, cases of SARS in Australia. And um, so it came and went suddenly. It had the capacity to spread uh, very quickly and was highly infectious, and that's often not a good thing for an infectious disease to be sustained. Um, and uh, people obviously got very sick with a high mortality rate. It came and went so quickly um, that we still, you know, um, uh, 15 years later, don't have um, an antiviral for SARS, nor do we have an effective vaccine. But what SARS did do was really change the way um, that we think about global health security. It certainly um, gave people a very, very big fright, and it established a whole mechanism for, um, for how we respond to new infectious diseases through the international health regulations that are an um, international legal instrument that binds many countries across the globe um, to uh, uh, respond to and share data in response to an outbreak. And interestingly, this was first um, adopted back in 1969 when um, it only dealt with three diseases, cholera, yellow fever and plague, but now obviously um, dealing with many, many infectious diseases and has, to, has had to be tested many, many times since this was developed in 2005. 
And then Zika virus um, bring, brought out a whole lot of other new challenges. Zika virus was not a new virus. It was a virus that we knew a little bit about, um, had, but had predominantly been in the Pacific. And then uh, through international travel, uh, it entered into the Americas, or particularly South America, um, where there suddenly was an entire population of people that had never been exposed to Zika. So managed to spread through that population uh, with great rapidity. This shows you the epidemic curve, or the peak um, of Zika virus infections, and you can see almost entirely in South America the Caribbean and Central America with a rapid decline. What was um, an inc a lesson uh, with Zika virus was that the manifestations of Zika virus looked very different um, in South America to what had traditionally been described as just a, f a fever and a self-limited illness. And there was this extraordinary um, complication that took a very long time to actually identify understand and fully characterise, uh, which was congenital Zika syndrome, so that Zika virus was able to infect and cross the placenta in pregnant women and impair neurological development. And there were some um, very chilling stories of uh, quite significant stigma um, and discrimination reappearing with Zika virus with this very obvious um, abnormality from um, children that had been infected. A Zika virus also highlighted the importance of, of vector control. The same um, mosquito that transmits Zika virus also transmits dengue and other infectious diseases, um, chikungunya and yellow fever. And a lot of um, very interesting work now um, tackling the vector or the source of transmission rather than um, treating the virus itself. So um, I think many of us that work in this field think about um, what's next and um, how we're going to identify uh, what might be next and what impact that might have, and more importantly, how can we prepare for it? Well, there are some um, people in the field that think that we can protect, potentially predict um, the next epidemic or virus through genetic sequencing. So just like the big breakthroughs that we've, um, you've all heard about for sequencing the human genome, you could potentially sequence um, every virus or environmental sample or widespread animal testing to see and identify potential new viruses. And this is um, a project called the Global Virion Project, um, a 10-year partnership to detect the majority of our planet's unknown viral threats, a huge and ambitious goal and very controversial because this would cost um, millions and millions of dollars and we may not, never know whether the viruses we're going to identify will actually um, go on to cause human disease. So I think we probably need to focus on um, what is more predictable to occur. Um, certainly bats are a key feature of past and future outbreaks. So understanding the biology of how and why these viruses can infect bat bats is key. If you just look at that list, five of the most significant emerging infectious diseases that have occurred in the last two decades have all been um, spread by bats. I think we also need to think about vir um, infectious diseases that we know um, and almost certainly will keep coming back. And the big one here is, of course, influenza. Um, influenza virus will keep changing and will keep returning. And this map just shows you the different types of influenza. We name them based on proteins that sit on the surface of the virus by letter H and letter N. And once those virus, any time that virus, um, a new virus appears that people have very little immunity to, a far greater likelihood that that virus will spread more widely. So there's lots and lots we can do in preparing for um, influenza. And there's a lot of work being done um, in making sure we've got clear and defined plans to do that. In addition, science here could make a big e effect as well. If we had a capacity to have a single shot of a flu vaccine, that would also make a very big difference in how to respond to flu and a key source of scientific investment currently. Antimicrobial resistance um, is also something that we can predict and do ne need to be prepared for. Um, this data comes from the O'Neill report, which was um, performed in the UK and um, estimated the numbers of deaths 
that will occur from antimicrobial resistance or AMR by 2050 if we don't do anything different to what we're doing now. And the estimated number of deaths shown there in the purple uh, box is 10 million as compared to about 700,000 deaths that occur currently from antimicrobial resistance. And to put that in perspective, you can see what a, um, a um, death from cancer is estimated currently at around 8 million. So the impact could be very, very significant. When we think about antimicrobial resistance, I think we need to think about these established infectious diseases such as TB, or multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, that one of the highest rates just to our near north in Papua New Guinea about resistance to, for malaria to commonly used drugs or uh, artemisinin, again, um, in, in our, our new neighbourhood, as well as these new strains of bacteria um, that were now being reported that are resistant to all available antibiotics. So tackling antimicrobial resistance um, uh, is going to need a, a very large investment, um, not just in the science. I don't think it's new antibiotics that we necessarily need um, in tackling antimicrobial resistance, but it's very much around antimicrobial practices in both human um, and animal health um, that are going to be absolutely key and something that needs to be tackled um, at a regional or global level. So um, in closing, I'm going to briefly talk about um, what Australia is doing, um, both locally and regionally. Um, there's certainly a very established and well-developed um, coordinated all-of-government response plan that we have predominantly uh, um, um, directed towards influenza because we, um, that has the highest certainty of recurring, um, but also to other communicable diseases. And um, that plan uh, is, um, is extensive and detailed. It's an all-of-government response that involves Commonwealth and every state government. We also um, certainly need uh, the physical capabilities to cope uh, with these new um, infectious diseases. And it's a photograph of Julian Druce, a virologist at the Doherty Institute, um, dressed in uh, a spacesuit, which is what you need to um, actually isolate certain organisms um, like Ebola or SARS. Um, certainly not something that we need in every city, in, in every um, town across Australia, but we do have um, a capability should that be needed within the country. Um, the Australian Government through the NHMRC have also funded um, a national network called APRIZE um, and we have some members from APRIZE uh, in the audience here. We've got Ross Andrews is one of the um, key uh, senior um, co-investigators. This is a national network that is focusing on research entirely related um, to preparedness and response. And um, I could highlight a whole lot of different projects that are happening within a prize, but I think one of the key projects is one that Ross actually leads, and that is working with Indigenous communities. When we had um, a severe outbreak, we had a severe strain of influenza H1N1 um, several years ago, Indigenous communities were significantly adversely affected. There's also, and it extensive um, history around infectious diseases and um, terrible outcomes um, in Indigenous communities. And this is a great example of when we can't, why we can't do something on the run as soon as a new infectious disease emerges. You need to build that capacity and understanding and relationship that goes, um, that um, needs to be established before um, something happens and that's a big focus of what uh, Ross is leading as others within the prize. And although a lot of our work focuses on preparedness within Australia, uh, we're very conscious about how we work with neighbouring countries and we are part of an international network um, for the treatment of um, something called SARI or Severe Acute Respiratory Illness which could be flu or could be another infectious disease. And um, this is led by uh, one, another chief investigator, Steve Webb, who um, is part of a network with about 200 sites across 33 countries, um, developing what's called um, shovel-ready protocols, so um, pre-approved, um, pre-planned uh, research infrastructure for should, um, in the event of a new infectious disease, which is actually critical for sample collection, Start, um, observational studies as well as um, interventions with um, vaccines or antivirals. 
Um, capacity building and training, um, obviously, and a very important um, and key uh, factor, both locally, that's what a prize does, but certainly within the region. And I, um, obviously, that's a big focus of the Indo-Pacific um, Centre for Health Security. Um, those partnerships and uh, capacity building are absolutely key. And I'm showing this photograph because I was recently actually in Cambodia, um, in Phnom Penh, and went to a lunch hosted by um, the ambassador, Ambassador Corcoran. And um, it was striking to me that uh, many of the key leaders in public health, uh, two of them photographed here, Dr. Tafala and Dr. Chi Chonoan, um, actually had their training in UNSW uh, in the mid-90s and they all came from a background actually working in HIV. I should add that Cambodia has one of the most effective responses to HIV in the Asia-Pacific region, has one of the highest rates of treatment uptake, a real success story. It's very interesting to me that many of these um, public health leaders um, actually now are in working in other areas. Um, uh, you can see here Dr. Chia, um, now the director of the um, National Institute of Public Health. So the, the impact of this, um, these sorts of relationships and capacity building are really enduring and I was, so, I was struck so strongly about that in my visit to Cambodia. And finally, um, there are of course um, many um, bilateral and multilateral um, partnerships that Australia is um, involved with. And I'm just highlight highlighting a few of them, these important key ones here. First of all, um, the Global Fund for AIDS, um, TB and malaria. Uh, Australia is the 13th largest donor of the Global Fund, having given over um, $600 million. And our contributions are so important to the Global Fund, largely because of um, our location in the Asia-Pacific region, especially in HIV. The burden of HIV is so high in Africa, it's quite easy for Asia-Pacific region to be um, for far less um, uh, focus on that area, and our presence there makes a big difference. Um, CEPI, a very recent um, and innovative idea of a global alliance um, to finance and coordinate the development of vaccines against infectious diseases and a focus on neglected infectious diseases or diseases in which pharma or pro private sector are less likely to invest, so particularly their current focus moves um, Nipah and Lassa virus, and Australia also obviously contributes to that fund, but they're going to do some really exciting things through developing platforms for rapid development of new vaccines. And finally, I just will mention um, the Global Virology Network, um, or GVN, um, which is a new network in which Australia is playing a very active role. And this links virologists globally um, for training, capacity building, shares um, resources from biobanks, and um, not yet tested, but uh, we hope will make a significant contribution in the event of an emergency response. So I wanted to close um, by highlighting what um, really might be possible when you have a bold and ambitious goal and bipartisan support. And the best example of that for me, um, in my own experience in global health, is, is PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. It was actually established in 2003 um, under the leadership of George Bush, which people are often surprised to hear. It is the largest um, commitment by any nation to address a single disease um, in history. And it has, um, the US government's committed over $15 billion um, over the last five years to allow access to antiretroviral therapy. And there's no doubt that that investment, um, along with all of the other factors I've described about, has changed the face of the um, HIV um, epidemic. And so although Australia were a much, much smaller country, you know, um, a, a 20th of the size of the US, um, it's something that I think we should all be um, uh, dreaming about, thinking about, and perhaps could deliver um, an impact on this scale. So um, I wanted to cl close by um, say again that I think Australia has an incredible opportunity um, to be a major global leader in health security. 
We are a country that can discover and innovate uh, just like Ruth Bishop did to identify new pathogens rapidly and also design novel therapeutics and vaccines. And we do that really well. But we certainly can't stop there. Um, the next steps uh, of translation and most importantly implementation through capacity building, health system strengthening, trusted enduring partnerships in health. Um, that's the way we can really be prepared uh, for what might be next. So I want to just close in thanking um, a number of colleagues um, and friends that um, I had the opportunity to discuss this talk with who also provided um, a number of slides and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you.